feel like I haven't done this in such a long time. Yeah, I, it's, it's been a while, right? Yeah, I like a month, done maybe. This in a while either. I mean, we we can look at the like participation sheet and see. When we were all. Who? Around. excited am i i mean i should not be texting yes. my aunt and i should be trying to launch a podcast um <laughs> but you know what won't be left for the game section of this show is episode 45 of the halcyon frequency podcast it's been a couple weeks since i've said that out loud i'm blind and i'm hosting this episode it's airing live november 27th 2022 uh i'm i'm blind and i'm hosting and i'm joined by fg squared how are you yes hi good evening uh good to be back it's been uh we checked before it's been a solid month for me as well being away from here so yeah. uh hello there how are you it's been a hot minute but i'm doing Sorry. all right and I'm, I'm okay too it's just like i said it's i'm a little flustered because like the last one of these that i hosted was like three weeks ago now because like we had the, the pre-recorded one and then other people did episode last time and i got to listen to uh, our lovely australian side of the podcast just like <laughs> talking about Scary animals spiders and spiders in and, toilets. And, yeah, and to <laughs> they're <laughs> just like that? we're not gonna make everybody afraid of like Australia. Like we're gonna try and dispel some myths. Anyways, check your boots for spiders. Um, but spe yeah, speaking of not checking your boots for spiders, how, how are you doing, Carrie? I, uh, great. I just <laughs> wanted to do <laughs> to add about uh, add on the turn because I listened to the podcast and before that I was actually honestly considering at some point going to Australia and visiting Drongo. Yeah. I've changed my mind. Just, <laughs> no, just stay in the just, urban no. place. It, it's it's like going to Canada and being afraid of getting attacked by a bear. Yeah, but like, I'm I'm super afraid of spiders. And then I don't know. Check your shoes. Check the toilet. That's just nope. To be nope. fair, what you what you can do is you just divert slightly south and just go to New Zealand, mm -hmm. and you're good to go. No, they have no Canadian don't have spiders. spiders. Everywhere has spiders. What's yeah, Canadian but not spooky. They don't so, have huntsman spiders that are like dinner plate size that just jump off from your what? wall. No, 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 no. Hunts, huntsman Sorry. spiders are, are harmless, though. Can we? Yes, I don't are. care. Okay. I don't care. So <laughs> I, Sorry, I was doing fine earlier. Now I just, I feel it crawling over me. Please don't. I, Sorry. I'm, I'm not going to say the word spider, but they're, they're, I, I do. You just did. Okay. There, there's an Australian <laughs> streamer who's a friend of mine who swears yeah. that if he ever has one of those particular spiders in his car while he's driving, he would rather drive it off the side of the highway than <laughs> deal with the spider. Uh, wow. So, yeah, they're pretty big. But, um, no, the yeah. biggest spiders but, um, that we have you know. here in Canada are probably maybe not talk spiders? about spiders. <laughs> cool. Cool. Awesome. So, like the size of the hot potato. I, I want to talk about potatoes. No, okay. potatoes. Potatoes? 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 Okay. Potatoes? <laughs> I've seen one this year. One, and it was in the hallway of the basement. Their cave I had potatoes for lunch this week, twice. <laughs> I have new potatoes in my uh, in my fridge. They're 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 pretty tasty with garlic, specifically. Oh, <gasps> yummy! Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Potatoes are good. And they don't um, have eight legs. Um, but uh, <laughs> so hot potatoes <laughs> happening. Um. And uh, this this is a podcast that's being recorded during the midst of this. Uh, the last episode of this podcast was a pre-recorded episode, which was uh, featuring um, uh, Suey's contact at uh, Doctors Without Borders, which is what the hot potato is benefiting. Um, but uh, since I'm floundering this, FG, do you want to talk about the hot potato for like 30 seconds and explain to people what it is? Yeah, sure. So the Rimbaud the Hot Potato Charity event is a yearly event that happens during American Thanksgiving, usually starts the day before and goes to the Monday after, and it's a relay of a safe file in RimWorld um, between, I guess this year it's 35 different streamers. It's 124 hours of content. We relay the safe file. We try to be nice to people because we are, you know, raising money for Doctors Without Borders. Um, so, you know, no war crimes, being nice. And this year our goal is to harvest lots of potato and re potatoes, plural, not just one potato, it's many potatoes. Mm -hmm. And thousands. raise hope, yes, and raise hopefully thousands of dollars for charity. We've already raised in total, like over the years before we start. Well, I guess, I guess actually with this year we have now cracked two hundred thousand dollars raised total for the yep. charity, yep. right? Wow. Total. 
I mean, the, so the current money. so much money. Current number looking at it is, for this year specifically is thirty one thousand seven hundred and ninety five dollars and fifty seven cents, um, mm-hmm. which for reference is uh, ten thousand more than we did the first year, uh, half of what we did the second year, and uh, fifty thousand off of what we did the third year. So, and weird, it's only Friday. Yeah, there was but, still Saturday, Sunday, and half a Monday left. And, and, and yeah. half of a Friday have left as well. So there's loads of people still left. And, and we haven't even had the heavy hit. We, ha- we had some heavy hitters, but the really heavy hitter um, is still coming. I, sh- I assume he's going to knock it out of the park again this year as well. I'm obviously referring to Italics. Yeah. Um, who puts on like this amazing show um, during the charity stream. So fingers crossed. It would be really lovely to beat last year's goal it would be even more amazing to beat 100k but then we we were really lucky that you know the last years yes people were affected but it wasn't quite like 2022 so if we don't do that this year that is also okay considering just the general state of everything the last few (laughs) years were like you know a lot of people were still riding the high of hey people are still paying really well but we're all locked inside and can't do anything. And now people aren't locked inside and can do stuff, but also the economy's taken a hit for obvious reasons. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, it, it is what it is and we'll see where we end up. But um, from my staring at historical documents from previous years, we're pretty much on par with last year. Like we're not, I think we're a little yeah. bit behind now, but at least for the first 24 to 30 hours, we were basically within a thousand dollars of where we were at at that time the year before. So we'll see. Yeah, we had some newcomers and they were like, yeah, I set my goal like 2000 and then they end up smashing that goal by like more than three mm-hmm. times that. <laughs> so yeah. you never know, right? Because I'm pretty sure Italics' community is like, well, we got to beat last year how much we raised. They're, they're all um, just over there flexing, just waiting. And I, I mean, like, yeah. and n- 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 we also haven't mentioned him yet, but like Ambiguous Amphibian is taking part this year and this is also his first time. Yeah. So I think that that's going to be a... Uh, a bit of a dark horse for Saturday. Although this is all like in the past because by the time you're listening to this podcast, it'll be Sunday. So all of this will have happened. So, um, yes, currently we are recording this on the Friday on the 25th. So, and also if you'd like to donate, we'll chuck a link to the general campaign, um, in the description. So if you're just a listener of the podcast, and you're not actually watching on Twitch. First of all, why are you not watching on Twitch? But second of all, there is also a link where you can chip in a little bit Mm -hmm. if you would like, and every single dollar counts. And if you've missed the event entirely, like if you're listening to this like six months into the future or something, um, then just like keep an eye out for next year because we'll probably do it again around November. Yeah. American Thanksgiving again, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I don't see that changing anytime soon. Nope. It's perfect because it kind of fits in between a lot of the big charity events that otherwise happen on Twitch. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, of course, no pressure to Arch who's going to have to go right after Italics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's Just, got this, uh, I believe. Of course. He'll handle it. I'm de- most, most definitely for certain. But uh, it, it's just kind of, I, I know that he's going to be listening to this. So, got to give him a shout out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I believe in you, Arch. You can do it. But you know, of on, course, you got this. On on more general terms, because like you know, it, it has been a bit since any of us have really recorded together. Like, w- what have you two been up to in the past few weeks? I mean, I went to Las Vegas, so <laughs> I've had a busy few weeks. I, the photos look so surreal. It, 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 so be, because I can actually talk about this now. Um, like. Because like Jess doesn't want didn't want people to say anything until after she got back, but um, I planned my trip for Las to Las Vegas about a month and a half in advance because I just found a cheap flight and I had a I have a my one of my mods is living in Las Vegas for three months, so I was like I could just crash with him, so f- stay is free, breakfasts are free, and I have transport, so it's like all right, sweet, let's let's go to Las Vegas, why not? Um, and uh, I, I think it was two weeks before I posted in this di- in our private Discord. It was just like, "Hey, he- heads up, guys! I'm, I'm gonna be gone this weekend, so you guys need to record the podcast on your own." Um, and then Jess was like, "Um, 
I'm going to also be in Las Vegas over two of those days. So um, <laughs> me and my mod moved our plans around because th- we planned on going a- on a hike the first day. And we-, we moved that to the Sunday, which was the first day that uh, Jess and Cilantro would-, would-, would be in town. And um, so we all got to go on a hike, which was fun. And then That's really cool, yeah. and drank a lot of beer in the evening. <laughs> what, a- what a great mm-hmm. coincidence. I love it. Yeah, it, it it was it was really fun because we got to take Hobo and his weeb mobile uh, out there, which uh, is covered in anime girls from a gacha game, um, <laughs> and which it's he he drives a Tesla. It's it's a nice Tesla, um, and it's covered in anime girls, um, which is really fun when you're driving on a busy highway and there's like cars slowing down around you and like <laughs> pulling up alongside you, pull, holding up iPads and taking photos <laughs> while you're driving, um, <laughs> which I, I guess is kind of the appeal of putting anime girls all over your car. But yeah, no, it, it, it was fun. It, it was, uh, I, I think like m- ma- things I really, cause I've never, I've never been to Las Vegas before. I think things that I really don't like about Las Vegas is everybody smokes inside, uh, because Ooh. it's a, it's illegal to smoke outside. So why, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it's illegal okay. to smoke outside, yeah. uh, mostly because like it's it's like you will actually die hot in the summer, right? Like, um, it, it's not uncommon for it to be in the high forties in the Celsius, um, mm-hmm. or low fifties in the summer. So like the entire city is designed so that you literally never need to go outside. Um, all of the ca- major casinos and walking areas there are uh, either flood heaters in the winter or flood coolers in the in the summer. And um, there are ways to literally go from casino to casino to casino without going outside. Um, so the result is it's very easy for them to have weird laws like it's illegal to smoke outside, but legal to smoke inside. Um, although inside it's even weirder because there's only certain areas of each building where you can smoke. So like you'll walk into the casinos and it's like hard floor, you can't smoke. Carpet, you can smoke. And there's like ashtrays everywhere. Um, but if you're gambling and you're in the casinos, then the drinks are free. So it's like... Huh. So you sit there, you buy a pack of cigarettes, you sit down, you start gambling, and then they just start bringing you booze, which I didn't do because I don't gamble. Um, so the actual like w- world for me was just walk from casino to casino and just see all the sights because most of them are about as dressed up as Disneyland. Um, it's it's like this weird... My favorite description of it that I got while I was there is it's honest Disneyland, where it, the difference between Las Vegas and Disneyland is they're honest about the fact that they're here to take all of your money. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, hanging out with Jess was great. Um, the hike that we went on, we went to the Valley of Fire. If you want to look it up, it's uh, just beautiful rock formations that are, uh, I think, as Jess said, really good level design. Like, there's a lot of areas where you're like <laughs> walking through like weird crevices and canyons that have like sand on the bottom, and there's like weird like formations on your side, and then you'll come up out of a crevice, and there'll be this huge monolithic rock that looks kind of like a sand crawler out of Star Wars, just like sitting there. Um, we got a little lost. We accidentally walked off the trail, but everything was kind of flat and you could kind of see everything from everywhere. You just had to jump on a rock and peek around and, um, eventually made it back to the car and Tesla auto drove all the way out of the park, which was a little bit unnerving, um, on this tiny little windy like desert road in pitch black. This car is just like hugging the road by itself. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it it was fun. And then Jess and Cell got married. So, um, then the, Super cool. the next day in the evening, right before I flew out, I met up with them in Caesar's palace and we got to hang out for another 40 minutes and then I caught an Uber home. So who are you going to meet next? Who am I going to meet we next? we met a couple months ago, right? Yeah. Then, I met... then Jess. Well, I, I've met Jess before. I met Jess at Twitch. Well, I know, but once. It, it seems like you were where the people are, right? <laughs> Who's blind going to randomly fly and meet next? Yeah. Um, Where are you going next? <laughs> I, I think realistically, well, actually, I'm, I'm going somewhere soon, but I'm not allowed to tell you where. It's not. It's not public knowledge yet. Most likely, one would be let's try and convince Sui to go to Pax West. I'm t- aside from that, probably. Uh, t- there's a possibility I might go to Paris. House in meeting in Paris. Yeah, that'd be great. Probably Paris. Anyway, now that I've rambled for Woo. 10 minutes, how's, how's your couple weeks been? Well, so uh, talking about Tesla, it has <laughs> taken eight and a half months, but we have finally gotten our new car. It finally, it's actually, it exists. It's outside. 
charging because uh, it's a Tesla. <laughs> Sorry. How does the silence feel? I see. The funny thing is, I haven't even been in the car yet because oh. <laughs> I didn't go to pick it up. Uh, Lex went to go pick it up uh, at the dealership uh, this afternoon. But Are you going we, to we... wrap it in otters? No. Oh. No. <laughs> no. It has. It's really nice blue color. Blue, blue color. Goodness. You know. You know um, what you need. You know those little things that hang from car mirrors. <laughs> you need one of those, but like two little dangly otters. Anyway, that's cute, but also very oh. distracting. <laughs> but no, um, no, we have we have a new car now. It's it's amazing. We have a car that's actually reliable because our old car, which is a second hand car, um, with a non functional AC, um, that's broken down like six, seven, or eight times in the last like three years. Um, it's it's nice to have a reliable car. It's gonna be great. Um, we can go places without having to worry. Oh, is this car gonna actually make it? Or is it going to be? You're going to come back. Yeah, exactly. Or will we? Will we have to call like, uh, you know, um, like the highway car recovery service thing again to go and come and fix our car? Like, like you know, I don't know what what would that even be called. Like, they do like breakdown coverage, like breakdown services, right? They don't mm -hmm. tow you, but they try to fix your car, like yeah, where are you are stranded, right? Um, yeah, because Lexus had to call them a lot because. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as I said, secondhand car. It's and it's getting gets getting there in age. And uh, yeah, now we have a you have an actual new car, and yeah, it's exciting. Uh, we're gonna go. I'm gonna go in it and go grocery grocery shopping on the weekend. Um, but no auto um, pilot. We didn't get that function because you have to pay extra for the auto driving thing, and we didn't get that. It's like really expensive. It's like six seven thousand pounds or something like that it's kind of expensive mm -hmm. yeah no the the dlc for teslas are a little off the charts <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but uh i'm just i'm just happy for lex so he doesn't have to be in a crappy car that can break down anymore because that makes me like because like when i'm sitting here because lex is like this type of person where uh, he'll text me eventually <laughs> but it's gonna take a while so yeah. i don't have to sit here anymore and be like well did the car break down again or is it just late is there traffic is he grocery shopping or is the car broken because now i'm gonna be like it's probably you know most likely not the car <laughs> now he's just driving around the car because the car is so amazing yeah 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 now i'm just being ignored on purpose <laughs> and, and your, your streaming setup probably costs more to power than the car Probably, yeah. Because well, I actually, the, I, yeah. I, I did the math. My 3070 uses more power per month than my parents' Nissan Leaf. Yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds but about right. Granted, a, a Nissan Leaf has like, it's like 40% of the battery of a Tesla or something. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, it's tiny, tiny it's battery. It's like a golf cart, basically. <laughs> but I mean, but, if yeah. you, you know, if you, if you drive like less, like if you drive distances of less than a hundred kilometers. Oh yeah, no, they they live in, they live in the city, and like I think my dad's like forty kilometers away from work, and my mom walks uh across their house to go to work. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, exactly, exactly. But no, that's 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 very exciting. It's the uh, first ever new car that I've owned, so to speak. Congratulations! Really cool. Thanks, K Kiri. How have you been? What have you been up to? Yeah, very, very busy, um, but but also like super good busy, actually. So there, there are a lot of things that I'm not allowed to talk about, but I can talk about a couple of things like the D&D &D project I'm part of. Ooh, I probably of haven't talked about this on the podcast yet, have I? I've just seen pictures on Twitter. Yeah, well, maybe I haven't mentioned it, but so my tattoo artist and two of his friends, one is a photographer and the other one is a video producer. They've they've come together to make a D and D project on YouTube, like a, a let's call it role playing channel on YouTube. But they're gonna start with D and D, and I'm in the first season as a player. It's gonna mm. be in German. However, they've promised me ninety nine point nine percent certainty that there will be English subtitles, and and it's really cool because they've got like twenty five exper uh, years experience of playing D&D, &D, playing role paper games, playing live action as well. So it's super cool. Everybody is very experienced. The group is really, really nice. And we started recording with session zero on Sunday. So a bit after the podcast episode goes live, it's the first actual session. And 
All of this is going to happen in January. That's when they start releasing videos. Fascinating. I can't tell you a name yet. The website isn't live yet, but very soon, because we, we have material like the, the web interviews and photo shootings and stuff. It's super professional, very, very high production value. And, and very soon the website will go live with teasers and images. And actually this Sunday on stream, um, after, no, before the episode goes live. So when you listen to this, you can actually already look it up. I'm going to reveal the portrait of my character because I'm playing a half orc, half human barbarian female called Valkyrie. I, I see the pun there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> my community came up with it because I I talked to the organizers and said, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm a streamer. They know that. And I've got my community and and I mentioned that it's going to be D&D &D stuff and everybody was super hyped about it. So they they agreed to me creating my character together with the community. And we did that during one stream where obviously first I talked to the DM about this and we, we came up with, I can let them decide uh, what clan I'm from, like what, what animal the, the clan is named after, what the clan is doing. Um, why am I leaving the clan to go into the city where we start and, and so on. So I let people decide a couple things and yeah, it's, it's, we came up with a really, really cool character and soon, once you all hear this, you can also look up what she's going to look like. And of course, we'll I've have seen it. It, images it's in amazing. the description if they're yes. linked by then. <laughs> Might have oh, to absolutely. Yeah, later, I can, but yeah. No, I, I can I can give you the link as soon as as I posted it. Sweet. Yeah. No. That that'll, that'll yeah. No. Cool. It's it's really exciting because I I played D and D and I played other role playing games before, but I never really got into it because it's such a time commitment. Yeah. But mm. it's still a time commitment. But now there's a really high production value. Everybody's super experienced, and I kind of considered work. And now it's so much more fun. It's like a side gig. <laughs> I have I have a problem. It is a side gig. Yes, it's it's not paid yet, but it, you know if that becomes successful. I have a question. Are you guys using yeah. like miniatures? Are you guys using like coins? What are you, what are you using to represent your your characters? If I can ask, we're gonna use miniatures. Yes, when there's a battle map, there's not always gonna be a map battle map, but miniatures. And during my hot potato stream. Uh, the community smashed a goal for a miniature painting stream. And I actually have the miniature. Okay, so my tattoo artist is also like, he's just an artist overall, not just with tattoos, but also sculpting and, and painting. And he's going to paint the, the miniatures. But then I've got the same miniature and I'm going to paint it on my stream too. Okay. He's going to do so much better, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've got miniatures, yeah. You can put it up to a community vote. Uh, you can put it out to his social media and see if he painted it better or if you painted it better. <laughs> right. And we'll, we'll see if right. we can rig it with Twitch people. I'm sure that we can get some numbers in here. Maybe. <laughs> you put up both yeah, images it's... to your community and he puts up both images to his following. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. <laughs> I can't say how this is going to go, but it's it's definitely a really cool project. I'm very excited about it and I, I just can't wait to share more about it. Because I'm, I'm hyped. I'm very excited. If, if I was in something like that and I had to paint my own miniature, I'd, I would just paint it like pink. I'd just give it like one color. <laughs> just be like, there you go. I'm, I'm going to try to to make it look w what I think she looks like. What I know she looks like. Because I've seen the portrait. But... Gotcha. Yeah, and it's really cool. Yeah, that... um, so I, I hang out a lot with my tattoo artist. But, and, and I've... I'm continuing my sleeve because so I've had a first session and on Monday I've got a second session and maybe that's enough. Maybe I need another one. Who knows? But tattoos make me happy. Tattoos make me happy. I, um, yeah. I, I've, I've been like in this between tattoo artists thing for a very, very, very long time because uh. my tattoo got done before the pandemic and my tattoo artist has, like, I reached out to him was like six months ago. He's officially stopped doing tattoos, just not doing them anymore. Oh, He's no. just gone completely to glass work and uh, like street art design. So he, he gave me a couple of references to other people and I just kind of don't like any of their portfolios and they're all far away. Yeah. So I'm just mm. like, 
kind of, I've been between tattoo artists for a while and also like not really had the money for tattoos. Cause like the last time I, when I got this, yeah. like the last big piece that I did, um, I had a roommate still. So, uh, rent was cheaper <laughs> and also rent was cheaper. I was like, re- rent was like $200 a month cheaper back in 2019. Um, so I like, I've, it's been money and time and also finding an artist, but like, you know, may- maybe next year if things go well, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Still have the designs. Just need to find an artist. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's already it's half the, difficult. you know, it's half the work. Yeah. Finding the design. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah, that that is true. But like, find the right artist is really difficult too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, fortunately, it's it's not a custom work, right? It's just like a collage of like Valve, like mm-hmm. concept art. <laughs> so it's like it, it's it's more of a matter of tracing, less of a matter of like individual artist that matters. But it it's true. still uh, difficult it's to find somebody to... that you trust to replicate it, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because you want it to look good. <laughs> Yes. Yes. You you want it to look good, and you you only really got one shot. And if you don't like it, then you gotta just go over it with something else. So it better be clear enough that there's space to go over it and some, with something else. You don't want to end up looking like the uh, oh, what's his face from um, Rage Against the Machine, where he just has those two fully black sleeves because they used to be covered in less than <laughs> optimal tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know. Ah, uh, yeah. That that's always an option too. Yeah. But, I mean, there's definitely but, things you can you can do to get rid of tattoos without just like getting laser tattoo removal. But yeah, yeah, no, that's true. They're it's really cool. My my artist, his his designing what I have is paintbrush strokes, calligraphy style, I suppose, and then watercolor splashes. Mm. And and he designs that on you. So I said, you know, I want to continue my sleeve. I gave him my underarm, and then he takes a like a marker. And starts designing it. Oh, that's rad. And and then he shows you, you know, you, you walk up to the mirror, you look at it and say, you, yeah, sure, let's go. But you only see the paintbrush strokes. So even now, I have no clue what it's going to look like at the end. Like, yeah, I, the paintbrush strokes are there mostly. Not all of them are filled in. But I, I'm going to choose the colors, of course. But I don't know where the color goes. And, oh, that's, that's exciting. And that's why I think it's so important to trust them. Not everybody works like this, right? But I couldn't do this with a person I don't trust. But I, I, I love all his designs. I know it's going to be amazing, but I don't know what it's going to look like. Art is fun. Speaking of art, video games are art, and we're going to go to a real quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the video games we've been playing over the past week. We'll be right Sounds back good. after this. This episode of the Halcyon Frequency Podcast is brought to you by... Suey. Follow or else. You heard it here first. It's cyber cute, not cyberpunk. You understand? Cute, not punk. Potions are definitely a soup. That's wrong. Cut! Hey, wait. I'm, I'm, I'm not done yet. And we're back with episode 45 of the Halcyon Frequency podcast for November 27th, 2022. We're going to be talking about the games that we've been playing this week. And uh, I think FG and Kiri are going to start us off here with Endless Dungeon. Yeah, Endless Dungeon is still not out, but the second open def is currently uh, until Monday. So if, if you listen to the episode as soon as it's out, you could... Okay, wait. Wait. If you listen to it on Sunday, yeah, you so theoretically it, could squeak it in. Yes. However, I, I kind of forgot something. I'm not sure why, but it's called an open dev, but it's actually a closed open dev. So not everybody can play it. You have to sign up for it, and then you pick. I don't know what the you know it's like a what the requirements are. Maybe I'm not sure. So mm. I actually asked Amplitude about this, and they said they call it open dev because. People can play, and then it's open development because then they they provide feedback, and that feedback is used to continue working on the game. But it's not open in the sense of everybody can play it, so it's a closed open dev. Anyway, but if you have access, you could still. Uh, yeah. Any case, um, <laughs> <laughs> I failed. Um, it's a ah, oh, what is it? An action tower defense wave defender. I 
uh, roguelite. Dungeon crawler. Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. dungeon crawler. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it looks really cool. It is super fun. Obviously, it's not done yet, and there are a couple of issues. And FG and I played together, um, which was super fun until it didn't work anymore because I got a black screen. I heard everything, and I heard opening the menu and running around and, and shooting and stuff, but I didn't see anything. And then yeah. I couldn't join back into the game and sad times. But as long as it was working, we had a great time, I think. Yeah, no, it was really fun. Like, I think that's, um, yeah, it's it's obviously not out. And, you know, there's nothing, there's no reason to be angry about it not working at the time because oh, yeah, yeah. it is literally like the second playtest that, that ever existed. There's a ton of bugs in the game and all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, stuff is bound to be broken and it's bound to be to, to break and all that sort of stuff. But it's um it's really fun and yeah you gather when you run around so basically you have to go through different zones and you go through different zones the enemies get harder you get better upgrades for your character you get better upgrades for your turrets and you find meta progression up upgrades throughout the levels that you then can use on your next run uh to get not necessarily stronger but you get like a different loadout and there's drinks that you can find that make you stronger that buff you and all sorts of stuff and um the art style is really cool i really like the art style and yeah because um, it's like it's 3d top down like like not top down, but like isometric view but there's also almost a little bit of like i don't know it's hard to describe like a comic borderlands type art going on yeah. like it's not really cell shaded but it's it's really hard to describe i don't know how life. to describe it yeah it it doesn't look like it's not like 100 percent like super realistic there is some it almost looks like science fiction tf2 or um, yeah what's another example it actually it kind of looks invisible inky if you ever played invisible ink no, I haven't. I you actually should play haven't. Invisible Ink. Invisible Ink is incredible. <laughs> Nobody's played Invisible Ink. What is wrong with you? It's the best I game that Clay ever made. I don't like South games. That's my problem. <laughs> I really don't like them. It's, I get, a, I get... it's an XCOM style game, though. Is it? Am I, yeah. am I confusing it with something else? I mean, it, it is stealth first, but it's an XCOM. It's a turn-based strategy. Yeah, but it's mostly, it's like, you're not really supposed to fight if you can no, avoid you, you, it you right? have a stun button and a stun baton but like no you you dodge around enemies and they have patterns yeah. and stuff but it, because it's turn-based it doesn't feel like a stealth game it's a strategy game and yeah, you know what but... their patterns are anyway talk about <laughs> <Okay. laughs> stealth ga just 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 to throw it out stealth games make me actually irrationally angry but anyways yes and it's dungeon it's not stealth game based at all no 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 you go in like the bigger duck of the be better and that's what makes yes. it feel so satisfying yes playing the gunplay like the gunplay is really fun. <laughs> I really like it. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's super cool. Uh, the, they added a new character as well for this open dev, which is actually my favorite. They're called Shroom, and it's a healer. Super fun to play. So, it's, yeah. yeah, it's not done yet, but you get a good impression of what the game is going to be like. And this is definitely one of those games that is better in co-op. Yeah, but you can also play it single player. You just get AI, and you can, tr you can, you can direct the AI, and you can switch between the different units of the ai i haven't tried single player this this open def at all i have to say mm -hmm. um i did it last time and there the ai controls like directing them was a at least for me a bit broken but it was the first play test so yeah you know i'm sure that's gonna get um much more refined oh definitely uh, later down the line yeah so. like it works but the ai if you put them somewhere and say you know guard here they will automatically shoot enemies, but they don't use the special abilities. Hmm. Yeah. And they should, yeah. but they don't do that yet. Uh, I have a question. So I, I played the, the original Dungeon mm -hmm. of the Endless, but I haven't played any of these open devs uh, for Endless Dungeon. I, I, and aside from like art style and visual flair, what, what are some major differences between the two games, if either of you know? So Dungeon of the Endless is... Um... You you spawn stuff. You, you spawn enemies when you open doors, right? Mm -hmm. In endless dungeon, it's time based. Okay. So, 
you get resources when you open doors. That is still the same. And you you can light rooms because not every room is lit. In the beginning it is, but then the further you go, that you will have crucial rooms that are not lit and you need special resource for it. Um, but when waves spawn depends on a lot of factors. Um, I was actually playing with Jordan, who's the streaming specialist at Amplitude. So he, he knew a lot, but he didn't tell me everything of how it works. But it's basically... Um, where you are currently in the dungeon and how strong you are and how many uh, rooms you've already opened all of that de- like impacts when the next wave comes gotcha. which you don't know just sometimes like every now and then you get 10 seconds and then you've got the next wave so it's it's not regular when it happens and how, how is it different otherwise I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if there are it, a lot if of similarities i'm trying to figure out if it's if it's a if it's more of a continuation or an evolution i guess like continuations for a sequel which is like it's the same but more and more polished or it's not a style. sequel uh, it is not a sequel hmm. but then what is it a reboot it's also not a reboot it's it's heavily influenced by it and in the same universe then eh. Okay, I won't complain, but I'm complaining. It, it, I, know, I know. I'm complaining. I, I asked the you can't scramble the title of a game a and say it's not the sequel. It's not a sequel, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Stop being... You're, you're not their marketing, Gary. I know, I know, but I really like the game. That's fair. You can like a game and still say it's, that this is silly. God damn it, It video is silly. Games. No, no, no. I can definitely <laughs> say that, and I agree, because, you know, you have Dungeon of the Endless, and then you have Endless Dungeon, and everybody's confused about it. Everybody's I'm gonna confused. keep calling it in, like Dungeon of the Endless Two. I'm doing like, this. That's gonna. This is why I'm and not you know in the what? open. Everybody's desk. gonna know what you mean. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, but no, you, you'll get loads of people that come in and are like, "Wait, is this a new, you know, Dungeon of the Endless, <laughs> or it's is this like, like Doom, I, Doom 2016 I is Doom Four? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I didn't no, realize Doom 5, this was Doom Four was on the N64. Anyway, you know, Doom. Dungeon of the Endless or whatever. Like it's yeah, it's it's. I understand that the universe is endless because you have, you know, uh, Dungeon <laughs> of the Endless, uh, you know, Endless Legend and that sort of stuff. But but it, it's, it's also maybe not the best moniker for a universe. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm a huge fan of Endless Space too. That was maybe one of my favorite four X's of that that I've played in memory. Like it's one of my favorite space four X's ever made. Um, loved that game uh, and. Really liked um, why, why, Endless Legend, which I wanted to call Endless mm-hmm. Fantasy for some reason. Um, and I, I never played any of the expansions for it, but I, I loved that game. Like the, the, Their 4Xs are great. And uh, Dungeon of the Endless was also quite a bit of fun when I played it. I only ever played it in single player, but I enjoyed it. Um, and it's like, so it was lo- looking at this, it's just I'm equally at the, I, I'm, I'm amused, frustrated, and kind of annoyed that they didn't just call it a sequel. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> Um, sounds cool. Like I, it's, it's one of those yeah. games that I'm looking forward to seeing it develop and I, I hope to play some of it when it releases. Yes. Next year. Yes. Speaking of new releases, um, and ones that should add more, um, support for people who have motion sickness. Uh, I played the early access release of zero F- Sievert. Um, mm. and so I, I've played, I played a few of their like pre-release builds, uh, from about three months before release until now. Uh, after release uh, and I have one thing to say they they took the difficulty dial and went from about 2 and put it to 45 <laughs> um, oh God. on the release okay. patch like the game Oof. went from being like mean and difficult and punishing to being obliteratingly difficult um, and there there is when, when you start a new, new save in, in the game now there's two options there's what they call hardcore and normal um, so hardcore, when you die, you lose everything in your inventory except for what you have equipped, um, or ex- mm, except okay. for what you have equipped, and or like your like your gun, your your main gun. You lose your secondary, and you keep what's in your hot bar, basically. So any meds or food that you have in your hot bar. Gotcha. And that's it. Um, invent- uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zero Sievert, Zero Sievert is an extraction shooter in the vein of Escape from Tarkov. 
uh, where you spawn into a map and your goal is to interact with the map and its systems and loot as much gear as possible to then make it to a specific point on the map so that you can air quotes extract from the map and then go back to a home base and then you use the stuff that you looted out of the map to craft crafting, uh, ba basically build your base, uh, and there are characters in your base that give you quests, which are usually asking you to go get specific items from the map, and then you go back out into the map and you get more things. The thing that's very different about this extraction shooter versus other extraction shooters is it's single player only, there's no multiplayer, um, and it is a top-down pixel art game instead of what most of these are, which are borderline mill sims or semi-realistic first-person shooters. Um, and so because of that, it's, it's kind of a unique take, um, and it's also able to do some interesting things. Um, so previously, like my, my issues with the game was that, um, the maps were quite static. Like they're, they claim to be randomly generated, but they're, I, it's hard to call them that they're basically just like they scramble the locations of things, but it's like the locations are static. They don't change. However, what the game mm. does do and is doing a lot of now that the game is out and fully playable, um, in early access, I should note, um, is a lot of the quest lines are open. And now that there are quest line NPCs, what they do is when you go and get a quest, it'll be like, okay, go to this particular map, like so let's just say the forest, and they will say, go find the lost convoy. And what it will do is it'll put a circle on your map for like a third of the map or something. And that whole circle will be completely different from the previous versions of that map that you've seen. There will be a different road there. There will be different items. So basically like they spawn in set pieces for certain quests on these pre- Mm. semi-random maps, which is actually a really neat way of doing things and adds a lot of variety and gives you a reason to be constantly turning through these quests because it changes your maps. Um, there mm -hmm. is going to be eight maps and three of them are currently missing. Um, one of them is semi-finished and says in development. You can play it, but it lags like to all hell. Um, and uh, the map variety is pretty good. Um, you know, you, you've got your your forest, which is just like a forest with a town. Uh, you've got your uh, like makeshift camp, which is basically kind of like forest, but more of a junkyard with a lot of radiation. Um, you've got swamp, which is just full of monsters and a lot of radiation. There's a mall because it's an Escape from Tarkov style game. Mm -hmm. um, there's an industrial district. And there is one other, which I called factory, which I haven't been to, which is in development. Um, and then there's two that haven't been shown yet. So it weapon variety is pretty decent. Um, all the guns have kind of funny parody names uh, of the real life counterparts. Um, there's a lot of uh, modules and customization for your, for the various weapons. Um, the there there it actually does a pretty good job of feeling like a multiplayer extraction shooter, even though it's not. Each map will have uh, various different tiers of enemies, from bandits that are basically unarmed grunts with pea shooters, all the way up to. Uh, end game gear kitted out dudes that'll three shot you with a minigun from halfway across the map. Um, like you'll just be walking then, bop, 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 and then you're dead and you're like, whoa, what hit me? <laughs> just no idea. <laughs> You'll never know. Um, but um, the, the gameplay is very focused on being observant. So you are rarely looking at your character. The, the camera's tied to the mouse and it's like this for a reason. You have to be moving and looking like two screens away from your character at all times in order to not die to these guys at a distance. Um, the different factions in the maps, there seems to be three or four of them. Like I said, there's the bandits who have pea shooters. There's what are called hunters, which seem to travel in small groups and they're more geared. There's scientists, which are quite geared and have very scary guns. And then there are um, basically dudes that are like your character who travel alone, who fight with all factions. Um, and then there's also mutants. And mutants are anything from these things called ghouls, which are very stalker, kind of like all, they run on all fours and kind of look like weird humanoid things that vomit on you all the way up to literal xenomorphs that teleport um and also wildlife there's wolves um there's rabbits that are harmless um there are uh wild boar um and various other small critters that i've seen there's also these like things called spiders but they don't have spider legs so <laughs> they, they just kind of look like these weird spherical balls that go <laughs> and shoot webs at you is that um, already arachnophobia mode if there's an arachnid, there, I mean, they don't, they don't look like arachnids. I didn't realize they were spiders until I shot one of them and, it, and looked at it, and it said that it was a spider, and it dropped spider webs. Okay. Um, like they don't look like they look like weird jelly beans, is what I would describe them <laughs> as. Like, I like that. Like they have no legs. Like they, they are not yeah. recognizable. They're just a single sphere. It's very strange. Um, so either that's like some early access thing, or like that. I, I don't know. Um, well, maybe that is a default arachnophobia mode. Maybe. I, I, I think that's... I 
Like, like I've looked at the all of the options looking for any kind of accessibility options, and there's nothing about arachnophobia mode. So maybe mm -hmm. the devs are just arachnophobic. Maybe. Um, Funny. Maybe, yeah. It's certainly not like uh, uh, satisfactory spiders where they make me jump. Um, like, I, I'm not phased by spiders in the slightest, and those ones scared me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, it's it's a neat game. I mean, it's, it's ear-splittingly difficult. Um, like, the AI is merciless. Like, pre-release, I was at the point where I'd basically win every single run that I went on, but now it's like, I'm I'm extracting maybe ten percent of the time, maybe, um, not, and not only because I'm picking fights that like I can't handle, but I I will like just wander into an area and then suddenly two different factions around me start fighting, and which leads to a lot of really cool moments. I, I mean, like I was playing in um, the forest map and I had I just acquired night vision goggles and I was just like crawling around late at night and like I see these two groups fighting and I was able to like sneak in and take out three of them and then completely overburden myself with like five guns and managed to extract and it felt great so it, it's um it, it's a neat little game and I, I think for anybody who's like passively interested in extraction shooters but maybe you don't want to deal with other humans and you want something that can be set to be a bit more casual try some zero sievert on uh the non-hardcore mode and the, and the reason I, I say that is because like even if you do die uh a raid, I guess is what they're called in these games, um, a run or going out into the world only takes maybe tops 20 minutes. It's it's actually like a really bite-sized experience and it's not like the, okay, we are committing for like to a 40 minute to an hour, like hour plus long extraction raid in uh, Escape from Tarkov. It's it's much more of a, yeah, you just, you, you get in, you get out, you, you get your gear, you go do it again. And it's, 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 it's per, quite well paced and plays well. Mm -hmm. And as for so an early you, access game, it's got a ton of content too. That's really cool. When you say don't play, you don't have to play in hardcore. There are difficulty settings then. So there, there isn't difficulty settings, but there's punishment settings. So when you start your save okay. file, you can select one of two modes. There is um, just play the game or hardcore. If you just play the game and you go out and you die, you respawn with lost time. So your character still gets hungry and you still gain thirst. Um, and the clock moves forward. Um, not that quests are tied to clocks yet or anything. I'm sure that will be a thing later down the line for like repeatable quests and whatnot. But currently, like you just lose time, but you don't lose any of mm -hmm. your gear. So you have everything that was in okay. your inventory before you left, but you lose your yeah. hunger and you lose your sleepiness and time moves forward because there is a day night cycle. Um, yeah. If you have hardcore turned on, you lose everything that's in your inventory, except for what's in your safety bars, which is one gun slot and your hot bar slot. Mm -hmm. So you lose all your ammunition, you lose all, and in that, playing in that mode, it is possible to screw yourself out of a run and have to uh, delete your save. Yeah. Mm. So it, I tried it, the demo for like a couple minutes, really not long, but I had issues with the camera, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, it, I wish. It sounds so fun, and I, I've never played an extraction shooter, and I would have loved to play it, but I, I need accessibility settings. I have trouble playing it with the camera and the camera is a necessary mm. mechanic unfortunately i know so. i i absolutely get it it's just very sad the only yeah. the only other way i think they could have done it would just be to like zoom the camera out a lot more but then stuff would be the size of ants so i don't know yeah 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 it's i i like i really wish i could play it too because like they like full disclosure like they sent me stuff they sent me a, a goodie package and i'm like Yay! You know, really cool. Like, you know, this is really cool of you. Thank you, and good luck with your launch. But I also can't play your game because it makes me nauseous. Because, mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the cam on on cursor in a top down game for me is like basically my second worst trigger for simulation sickness besides yeah, motion yeah. blur. <laughs> Immediately sets me off. Yeah, I, 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 I do have to like complain about one thing, and that's. It is an unapologetic Escape from Tarkov parody to the point where, like, the area you're in is called Zarkov. <laughs> and I really, really wish they were just a bit more creative with the writing because all it does is it just makes me completely tune out the existence of the fact that there's writing in the game and just, like, read the objectives and go out and play the game just as a mechanics-driven game. And I wish the writing in mm. World was a little bit more interesting. I mean, there's still room for that, hopefully. I mean, the currency in the game is called Raubles, not Rubles. Like, yeah, it's I'm, just I mean, I'm, I'm sure I don't think no. all of that is going to be placeholder. I, that's, I don't think that's that's not placeholder. That's, that's just the game. Yeah, 
Yeah. So the writing's not very good. That's that's my complaint. Fair enough. But speaking of uh, games that seem that 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 seem uh, better for people with motion sickness, how's how's against the storm, FG? So okay, all right, like. <laughs> Or I can stop oh. playing this game whenever I oh. want to, but how, I don't want to play. How many hours right? have you played? Sixty-five hours or good something Lord. like that. <laughs> I think it is a good game. Yeah, sixty-four hours, uh, and I started playing it two weeks ago. Um, wow, that includes I've I've streamed it all but well two and a half streams. <laughs> Gosh, this game has 3,000 overwhelmingly positive reviews. Wow. It's really good. It is. It's it's really good. Like, okay, so the thing is, okay, Against the Storm is a run-based city builder slash colony builder with meta progression, just to put that out there. It's in early access. Um, It's kind of on everybody's radar now because this year at the start of November, it came out on Steam. It was already out on Epic last year. Um, but you know, it being epic, nobody really, it kind of flew under the radar. I mean, it's good for them. They got the bag, right? They got the epic bag and and now everybody's playing it and you know, people are really enjoying it. Um, I was aware of it at the time, but there was so much other stuff that I didn't really get into it at the time. Um, I'm kind of glad I didn't because now there's so much content, which is really, really, really cool. So it's, it's not at the start of early access by any means. There's lots to do already. Um, but they're still adding like a bajillion things. They're amazing about communicating with the community. Um, they're doing updates every two weeks. They're adding new content every two weeks, which is insane. Yeah, it is ridiculous. And um, so basically what it is, it is a world in which um, it's constantly storming. So it is constantly raining. Um and uh you're trying to get resources and establish settlements in the world before the big storm comes in and destroys everything that you've built at the end of a cycle so basically you're just there to like generate resources for the queen um that gets very impatient with you later on that's a game mechanic um before the cycle ends and uh, the map gets wiped and then you have to start over again on the map um and uh yeah it's it is a it is a fantasy ish they call it rain punk setting because they have like stuff like rain (laughs) mills for example like mills that are powered by the rain because it's constantly raining um and it has several different species um you can play in your settlement you will have humans beavers harpies and lizards um they're adding a fifth playable species but there are more species um there is a there's a toad trader that visits you there's a raven there's a platypus there's there's a whole bunch of you know like animal species as humanoids besides the humans plus like fantasy creatures like harpies and um it's just i don't know it combines meta progression between runs um, because for a colony that you play, whether a win or you lose, you get XP that levels up basically your profile. The profile, yeah. Or yeah, and you unlock um, new things that way. But also for each um, settlement that you either win or lose, you get a certain amount of meta progression currency that you can then to spend uh, choose to spend on upgrades as well. Um, so there's two different ways of of upgrading stuff and um it it like combines that with the most fun segment of colony builders which is the start because (laughs) it is run based so each colony depending on what speed you can play on because there's a lot of speed settings like there's one x one and a half two and three x or something like you can play really really fast and you will play really really fast later on if you play on like low difficulties Uh, low difficulties and you're just trying to knock out some deeds um because i guess that's also a way to progress as well to get deeds aka achievements in the game because it also unlocks extra stuff um as well for progression um takes about takes me at this point about 
an hour an hour to three hours depending on what difficulty and speed i play on and whether or not i'm streaming it so it's relatively fast you can also save in the middle of a run which is also always imp uh, important um you know because uh, sometimes stuff just comes up and uh, it's just it's just so fun and the mechanics are just so well thought out the art is great it is it, it looks almost a little bit like warcraft 3 ish in the art yes yes it does the music is great. It's very chill music for a game that can get a bit stressful. Um, but because of the music and the rain sounds, I find it very relaxing to listen to. And like all my community are like, oh, yeah, this game is like super chill to watch. It's great. Like stuff happens and there's strategy involved. Um, but uh, it's also kind of chill. And um, also a big shout out. They have a bajillion accessibility settings. Um, like you can go like mega depth of field, flashing lights when the storm is happening, motion blur to make everything look like you, you can do like crazy things. There, there is a vignette, but you can turn all of that off as well, which is fantastic. Um, because you know, uh, vignette, flashing lights, motion blur, all of that is is yep. all very bad for my simulation sickness as well. I, I have it all turned off as well. Me too, and it still looks great. It still yeah. looks great. Uh, yeah i just i don't know uh play it it's it's really good it's it's um published by uh hooded horse um our friend cormacker who's been on the podcast uh works for hooded horse so it's you know it's 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 kind of close to our heart i guess on the on the podcast here and it's just it's it's so fun i just really <laughs> enjoy it and it's not expensive either like i've played 65 uh, 64 hours it was on sale. It's not on sale currently. It's 18 pounds. And yeah, it just had an update today. Um, cause, or rather yesterday, because it updates every two weeks on Thursday. That's, a like I said, once again, a crazy so quick impressive. clip for updates. But also, glad that that game's good. I mean, I... It's so good. Now that you mention it, it, it did in fact come out on Epic, but I also completely yep. forgot that it did. Yep. Like, no, honestly, like, if you like city builders, and if you like um like meta progression which i really like because even a loss still feels like you're progression progressing yes it's just so good it's just so there's so much content like i've played 64 hours i still have deeds to hunt because they're still adding new ones i still have levels to unlock and yeah there's just there's still so much to do there's there they, they have um they have a roadmap um of which most of the stuff isn't in yet which is bonkers wow um and they're adding um there, there's also a fifth playable species uh planned in the long run as well so they're not even that is like um finished because every species comes with its own mechanics and um you have to like keep your people happy but every species kind of wants a different combinations of items to keep them happy so you have to balance that with your gameplay because the the blueprints you get in your run is like semi-randomized um and like you get orders that you have to complete for the queen which are randomized and then the buildings that you get as well are randomized and you get something called cornerstones which is like modifiers like um if you let upgrade your hub to level two um uh the hot the, the forest isn't as hostile which makes your people not as happy uh, not as unhappy and all sorts of stuff like the systems are amazing like i could talk about this game all the time it's so good <laughs> It's so good. <laughs> I love so, that. Uh, yeah. Pl play it, I play it, it blind too. quickly uh, before Dwarf Fortress comes out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> play but it yeah. quickly before Dwarf Fortress comes out. Yeah, because like as if other games exist other than Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, exactly. Well, like in your world, it's I mean, just it's, al be it's already out for me. Like I can already play it. Well, well yeah, premium but yeah, okay. But... Yep, premium, premium. Yeah, yeah, true. But yeah, I... How much did you like it, or how little did you like it, Kiri? <laughs> I liked it a lot. I, I played it first when it came out on Epic. A year ago, plus, I don't know. Mm. And I liked it then already. And and I also like it now a lot. It's, it's really fun. And yes, it's the best part that you start over when you're like city building, right? It's just starting a new base, a new colony is kind of really fun. I do like the mechanics as well. Uh, it can get a bit stressful, yes, but but it's, I don't know. It's very, it's very enjoyable. Yeah. You, also, you un 
unlock buildings. So you don't have every building available to you, but you get cards. I, I, I don't know what it's called. But you get cards and then you can pick one out of three. And that's a new building that you can pick. But you can build that. It's just, yeah, it's so smart. And I was totally going to interrupt you. And I've totally forgotten what I was going to interrupt you with. I remember. I remember it. Okay, one one thing as well. And the cool thing is, um, there's a bajillion difficulty settings in the game. And most of the achievements, you could totally hunt on, like, you know, once you've played the game a bit, like, on chill difficulty. Um, but also for the people who really want to punish themselves. So it starts off uh, on Settler. And there's Pioneer, Veteran, Viceroy. And then Prestige. Prestige goes up to level 20. And each level comes with a new modifier. <laughs> this oh game can get really hard. So if you want to bash your brains against that. Full disclosure though, if you're, a, if you're an achievement hunter, you will have to beat the game once on uh, Prestige 10 and once on Prestige 20 to get the Steam achievements. Because there are Steam achievements for those. Oof. levels Eight. yes but once you've gotten like all of the level upgrades and all of the meta progression up the upgrades like they do significantly change the game like when you start out for example you can't trade and then yeah. later on you can you can trade and that you know once you get your trade going like i recently finished a run where i had almost like 400 i had 400 amber plus in the warehouse which you can use normally to buy which I need to have in the warehouse for an achievement. But anyways, um, I had so much stuff. I could have like literally bought all of the resources and all of the cornerstones that traders sell that then make my life easier in the game and also so, so forth and so forth. So like you can get to the point where you can really snowball and it almost feels like too easy at that point, which is, you know, which you kind of want to do sometimes in a roguelike, roguelite type game or a game with with you know that run based game you want to get to that point where you like ha, 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 this is easy ha, ha, suffer my you know like where you get like super op <laughs> and it's just fun um so yeah anyways play that game it's great so but before i you know dive into talking about a game that's going to take all day to talk about and probably i have too much to say about i'm talking about a game that i don't have a lot to talk about but I just want to talk about it because I still think it's good and I still think it's super underrated. Um, did either of you ever play Crisis? Nope. FG, did you I ever play Crisis? I played a little bit, but I, I, I actually, funnily enough, I didn't play Crisis. Ooh. I played the remaster when it came out on Epic last year. Okay, so you, you have played the like the first Crisis then. Yes, okay. yes, I have. So I, I I bought Crisis Remastered because I owned the original one because um, mm. I, I like Crisis. I've beaten it probably four or five times in my life. Um, I also really like Crisis Warhead, which is like this standalone expansion pack to the first Crisis. I don't really like Crisis 2, and I never played Crisis 3. Um, mm -hmm. But the the first Crisis, I, I, I just kind of want to shout it out because... The, the the remastered like version it's it's I think it's the PlayStation 4 version because they didn't have the source code for the PC version so there's like some oddities with it um, but largely it's fine it's it's a totally serviceable remaster it runs great um, I can max out literally every setting and get like 55 FPS on my computer if I tune things down just a little bit I can get a solid 60 no issue um, Crisis, every, everybody knows it, you know, but even if you've never played it or even seen screenshots, you've probably heard the meme of can it, can it run Crisis because it was the PC game that came out in like the <laughs> late 2000s of like that didn't run on anything. And it was the next generation graphics cards are going to run this game just great. So the result was nobody bought it because everybody was like, well, we can't run it. So why would we buy it? Um, and then everybody stole it. It was one of the most pirated games in history. And it was actually like, lar it largely is like the reason for like the, the prevalence of DRM and stuff now, because like the, the studio went a little nuts after that, because they're just like, yo, this game bankrupted us kind of. Um, and like, you know, Crytek as a studio has always been a, bit, a little bit weird and they, they still exist and they still make games, but like they, they're not quite the tech house that they were back then. They were more of an engine developer than a like game developer back in the day. But Crisis 1, I just, I want to shout it out because it is the only game that I've ever played where you can kill a man with a chicken. Um, 
And it's a very effective projectile weapon. Maximum strength, pick up chicken, throw chicken at head, smack dead. Um, but uh, it, it's for anybody who hasn't played Crisis, I just kind of want to say, if you can get Crisis 1 for like less than 10 bucks, do it. Because Crisis 1, first off, it, it runs on anything now. Um, and it still does certain things that you don't really see in FPS games. You can shoot a tree and it'll fall apart at the point where you shot it. And then you can cut it into tiny little pieces and it'll become individual physics objects. This is a game from 2007. Um, it, it is very much a sandbox and it's not structured like a lot of shooters are structured. Um, the levels aren't like a linear level. It's a massive open zone, which you look at modern games now and you go, okay, yeah, there's definitely games like... Far Cry and stuff where it's just like, okay, it's just an open world game. Sure, but these zones are very, very, very crafted. And they're very, very, very well paced. So you'll spawn into a zone and it'll be like, okay, well, you have to go to this area and you have to shut down this thing. Okay, so then there's like 18 different ways that you can approach that. You can like go down to this little uh, uh, like outpost and you can jack a car and then you can drive a truck in or you can stealth up onto a mountain and, and use like a sniper rifle and tag everybody down in this valley and then like sneak down and then like assassinate one by one like a stealth game or you can just snipe everybody or you can just run in guns blazing and jump over a roof and throw a chicken at a man, which is what I did. Uh, and it's <laughs> it's just a goofy, fun sandbox that does certain things with physics that you don't see now. Vast majority of the environments are destructible, and it's just a fun romp through the jungle shooting a bunch of North Korean soldiers, and then by the end of it, you're fighting weird squid aliens. It's just, it's cool. I I, I like Crisis, and I feel like it just kind of gets a bad rap for being the game that nobody could run with, like, middling sequels. But Crisis, it's fun. I like Crisis. It does sound really fun. It's just a goofy video game. And also there's something fun about, like, whenever you swap between the different armor modes, because there's maximum armor, maximum strength, and maximum speed, and then cloak. Um, and whenever you set it, like, your, your, your character just yells in your ear, maximum armor, um, or you can set it to a lady voice, and you're just constantly switching between these, so you're just, like, you're throwing stuff, shooting stuff, throwing grenades, and, like, picking up people and throwing people, and, like, kicking trucks all the while your character's screaming maximum armor maximum strength you just feel like an like a weird superhero it's very dumb <laughs> <laughs> yeah but. i need to get back to that and like play through it it, f it fell on the wayside because other things came yeah. along and yeah I've, I've had a lot of people recommend playing it like on the hard difficulty and like playing it like a serious immersive sim but honestly i just i set it to easy and throw chickens at people <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's just, uh, I, I like being an invincible super soldier. And you still die. Like, I've definitely died even on easy. But, like, you come around a corner and there's you... five dudes with rocket launchers and you, your life ends pretty quick. Have you died to a chicken? I have you, not died have... to a chicken, no. Uh, I okay. did I did die to a building I collapsed on myself, though. <laughs> um, I was, like, almost dead and I punched a wall because I had my fists out and I misclicked. And I had maximum strength turned on and I blew the wall out and the <laughs> building collapsed on me. It was like... Plunk. Kiri, do you want to talk to me about Flat Eye? Yeah, Flat Eye. Oh, okay, so I, I played the demo during the last Next Fest, and now the game is out, version one. What is it? Uh, you're in Iceland, and you've got a gas station. You're the manager of that, and you manage a clerk. Later on, more, but I only have one so far. And it's a somewhat post-apocalyptic world like there's still humans and society and stuff but apocalyptic events happened i don't know what happened yet um so it's a resource management game but also very story driven and there is an ai who's basically above you and the ai tells you to just watch what i don't know commercial video about your company and don't don't pretend or like pretend like the AI is not talking to you. And then it tells you that the Earth, all, all human civilization, is going to die unless something gets done. And she's got an idea how to save it, how to save everyone. And she wants you to help. So you are helping, right? And then you're this manager from, from a gas station. There's different phases in the game. So you start the day, you look at your computer screen, you've got different apps there, 
one to manage your your clerks, one to um, take your messages because every now and then you get a message from the the manager supervisor and the CEO of the company. And then you kind of lock documents, uh, diaries about incidents that happened. And there's so much more to this game that you think. Because it looks like a, you know, fun resource management game and a very unique art style. I don't really know how to describe it. It's a bit simplistic, a bit cartoony in a way. What was the name of that that, that third person game where you uh, fly around on different vehicles that you build in a desert apocalyptic world and uh, Japanese Breakfast did the soundtrack and was published by, I think, Raw Fury? No clue. I have no clue. Oh gosh, hold on a second. Let, let me look this up. Keep talking. Okay, you look it up. <laughs> it's, it's the one with the really stuttery animations. So it looks like that. Nope, still, still no clue. But it's it's very unique. Also, it is by Raw Fury, by the way. Sable. So. I think it was Raw Fury. Oh. Yeah, it was Raw Fury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, look, Sable. Reminds me of Sable. I, I know that. Mm hmm. So, so yeah, you you start with with that, checking your messages, and then when you unlock new documents, you read those documents, learn a bit more about the world and what happened previously, and then you start the day. The clerk comes in and it plays a bit like Sims because you can say, you know, clerk, you go and man the cash register, you go and refill the shelves, you go and repair this, and then you get these icons in the bottom right of the tasks, and then you can also cancel those again. And and it, that feels a bit like the Sims. You can also get more modules, you can get decoration, upgrade your gas station, make it bigger, and so on. Um, there's technology, and then you can unlock new things that you can buy, and then there are quests. And there, are... all the people except for you are just grayed out. They're not important. But then, I don't think every day, but every now and then, there's a premium customer, and they've got a profile. They're colored and and everything, and you know stuff about them because you know AI, and they collect all your data really, and then you talk to them. And also, a really cool thing about the game, it has content warnings. So before you start a game, you can say, you know, I want to be warned about death, about physical violence, about sex, about food as well, mental health. And and I tried it. Like, I, I don't need those content warnings, but I enabled it for death just so that I see what happens. And so if somebody comes in and, and the conversation would be about death, then you, you get a dialogue which pops up saying you know this conversation contains um the mention of a dead body for example and then you can decide do i skip it or do i still play it but then also if you decide to play you can skip it at any time during that conversation when you decide okay that's too much i can't deal with this you can skip it which is super cool i really like this and and then the clerk talks to the premium customer you are listening in and the AI is listening in as well. And then the AI talks to you and then you can talk to that clerk to direct how the conversation goes. Or you can just say, you know, let the clerk decide. But also the clerks that you start out with, out with they're just dumb. They actually have to trade dumb. So you probably want to tell them what to say. And that way you find out more about the story and somehow help the AI save the world, I suppose. I haven't played that much yet. I think, yeah, just one stream. So I'm about six hours in, but I find it so intriguing. I I would very I, go on. Sorry. Yeah, no, just very relaxing. The resource management part is very relaxing. It's really fun. But then, the the more you read about the world and the more you interact with those strange customers and the AI, the more intriguing it gets because you want to know what's what has happened in the past. How are we going to save everybody? I have no clue, but it's super cool. I'm very intrigued. I, I, I like it a lot. That is really interesting. Um, so I, two of my favorite games this year, and both are contenders for game of the year for me, um, are Norco and Citizen Sleeper. And the text and dialogue stuff seems to be coming from kind of the same inspirations. And when I say that, I, I kind of mean Disco Elysium. Um, just looking at mm -hmm. it visually and the way it's presented text-wise looks like that. 
and for me, games like that very much live and die based on the writing, and hearing you say nice things about the writing is really intriguing. Um, I was looking at reviews of this a couple days ago, actually, uh, because I was a little bit concerned, because I was like, okay, well, this is going to live and die by the writing, and I, I, I saw some kind of mixed responses to it. Um, like, for me, what, what made uh, Citizen Sleeper so special for me was just the absolute perfection that was that game's writing um and like the mechanics around the edges like that that game was a dice game right it was very much felt like a tabletop game um that that part was almost secondary to just the i want to get into another set of dialogue so i can see what these characters are doing um mm -hmm. and like i i look at this and i go that, that like that definitely with like your description of like some of the characters not mattering and some of them definitely mattering in the ai it definitely sounds like an interesting kind of commentary on the world and that that, that makes me very intrigued although i'm a little worried because i absolutely despise the sims so <laughs> I, I i look at that and i go Hmm, like there's one half of this game that I, I feel like I would really enjoy interacting with, but there's also another half to this game that I yeah. probably would greatly dislike. Although screenshot number 16 on the Steam page, I just want to say that's the best trash bin I've seen in a video game this year. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many different types of trash bins. Yeah, there are. So I actually also played this. Um, like Kiri, I played the demo, and then I actually did a full disclosure sponsored stream for the mm -hmm. release. And um, so... I'm not as glowing about it as curious. The world I am super into. The world is amazing. Mm. I'm seeing it as um, mostly positive reviews, which is why I'm cagey. Yeah, so the world is amazing. Uh, it's like, I don't know, there's, there's some stuff that you find out. Like, I don't want to spoil anything because, like, there's some stuff where it's like, excuse me, the AI did what already? Um, that's what I'm going to say because it's like, um, you know, spoilers. Uh, and I don't want to spoil the story because the story is the good bit about this game. Yep, mm -hmm. which is um, why so everybody I really here wanna... should play Citizen Sleeper. Good. <laughs> yeah. I uh, yeah, I really want to play. Uh, I really want to see where the story goes and what happens, because um, it does also have multiple endings, and this is one of those games that has multiple endings. Ooh. But to see the multiple endings, you don't have to play through the game again, which is nice. Um, so big shout outs for that. Um, I overall found the managing of the gas station a bit boring because it's like click there, click there, click there, click there, wait. There wasn't much else because the only thing you do is you, when you play a little bit, you stock shelves mm -hmm. and you repair items. Like the only thing you do all day is repair items as you're, you, you direct your clerk to repair items. Um, but the story bits are really cool and I, the yeah. world is really, really cool. The writing sometimes is a bit iffy because the devs are French, and you can tell. Yeah, the translation so sometimes is a bit awkward. <laughs> um, so it's not perfect English. There are quite a lot of typos. Ooh, um, I also found typos. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a you know, but what is really, really, really cool in this game, and like, like my hat off to them for this. So this is a game. That was inspired by people thinking about humanity and AI and then kind of thinking what is possible with AI and then they looked into what has already happened with AI and then they made a story around that so it mixes facts and fiction but this is literally the first game that I ever played that comes with a bibliography and it's a long bibliography it's like four or five like full pages just full of citations it's wow. they so much work i've not actually when... looked at it yet but i saw the button yeah it's really it's really cool like um a lot of work has gone into it um to like incorporate things that actually happen like it doesn't tell you in game like this is based on like a real thing but like you can go and just read through the bibliography unfortunately a lot of it is in french um but there are also quite a lot of english articles and it's just fascinating like the the how much work went into building this world which is why i'm i think that's probably actually the reason i'm most intrigued to continue and see where it goes because so much work went into it mm-hmm so yeah, that 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 is that's definitely like really really fascinating. 
for sure. Like I, I really enjoyed that. But yeah, the the, the day to day gameplay. I, I did also an entire stream of it. I, I did get a little bit over the whole click here and make your person go there. And yeah, click there. it's it's not the most engaging, but I found it worked really well for streaming because you know I just do that on the side and then I I talk to mm. chat and we. I don't know, try to figure out what's going on. So, yeah, yep, it's yep. it's a nice game on the side, like during the resource management phase. And then the talking to the premium customers or reading those diary entries and documents yeah. that you find, that's the super cool part. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Eavesdropping on people's it. lives. <clears throat> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the, the thing. Like... You, you know, literally <laughs> start with a basic toilet, and then the first thing you buy is a smart toilet that analyzes the people's, you know, leavings Feces. that they huh. leave. Yeah, and yeah. then um, that seems illegal. That, that data—that's the cool thing, because later on you have a management panel where you hook up power, but you also hook up, um, like for example, the data that the toilet gathers. You hook that up to the flat eye system that people can then use to go get like quote unquote fortunes and recommendations for their life and it gets like more and more dystopian and weird and just yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Sounds actually, misguided, but also fascinating. Well, it's obviously utopia slash dystopia stuff mm -hmm. going on for sure. Yeah. But it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I I I meant, I meant more like misguided date game design with really, really neat writing and ideas. Oh yeah, also yeah, yeah, yeah. Translation issues. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, FG, I know that you've just been talking a whole bunch, but could you tell us a sure. little bit about Soulstone Survivors? So, so like the 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 survivor like games, right? Um, that kind of saw a big popularity boost with Vampire Survivors coming out, and now there's like a bajillion of them. They're just movement based um, clickers. Not even click us because you don't click, do you? It's 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 except instead of clicking, you're moving. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as you can, mm -hmm. you, I, I suppose you select the upgrade that you want, and then you just go and roll down more enemies. Um, there is something very satisfying uh, in those games for my ADHD brain because bigger numbers go up and flashing bits go off, and they're just fun. I just really enjoy them. And vampire. Uh, Soulstone Survivors, <laughs> not Vampire Survivors, Soulstone Survivors is uh, the newest entry kind of in that genre. Well, not the newest, but one of the newest. Came out on the 7th of this month by Gamesmithing Limited, um, which I'm not sure if they've made other things. They've made Rogue Soulstone, which is a, they call it an action rogue-like, but that's not even out. It's an ARPG roguelike type thing, apparently. Um, so that's not even out, but I guess it's set in the same universe, the Soulstone universe. Um, and it's one of it's one of those games. It's an early access. It's not out yet. Uh, it's not finished yet, obviously. Um, the cool, th like the 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 unique thing about this one is it is um, top down isometric three D. Um, it uses part of that uh, asset asset pack that Blinds really really likes. <laughs> <laughs> They're really, really um, cheap asset packs that are yeah. on Humble all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. yes, yes. That Sly, one. Sly, Sly something studio or whatever. Yeah, the low, the low polygon yep. villager assets and that sort of stuff and mages and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, the it uses that. Unibrows. Yeah, it, it yep. uses part of that, but yep. um, like I mean, yep. uh, that's not the point, right? Yep. Um, at least, mm -hmm. at least <laughs> compared to other games. They paid for their art. Oh no, totally! Like I'm, I'm not, you're, you're, you're allowed to use asset packs. I just, I don't. I think they're ugly, yeah. and I'm tired of seeing them. Yeah, no, no. I guess, like, like once you, once you like, once you like think about it, you do start seeing them everywhere. They're literally like, everywhere. They're literally God, everywhere. Like there's yeah. like a game a week that sells like a thousand cop, like it gets on the popular releases and gets like a couple thousand reviews. That's like fifteen dollars. That's like, okay, so you yep. bought all of the art in this game. Okay, did you yeah, buy so the game too? <laughs> No, they didn't. But so, right. so what, most cases what, they don't. But yeah, yeah. So what the nice thing about this is, it's like it combines that survivors like stuff with the flashiness and the exuberant attacks of Path of Exile. Yes, right? I've like, seen a massive tech tree in this game. 
yeah well yeah the tech tree is not even that bad but it, I, I just mean like literally attacks in game like it's just like you know how in poe like basically when you watch a poe stream it kind of has to come with like a you know seizure warning because there's flashing lights and bips and bobs going off everywhere it's basically in this game as well um which you, but you can turn it basically off so it's you know like if you if you don't like that you can turn it down you basically usually have to turn it down because the frame rate gets um two literal seconds per frame sometimes <laughs> um but it's just that there's a ton of different classes um that all have their uh class unique weapons and uh uh certain um abilities that only they can get and um maps um it's not based it's not time based like it's not like at 30 minute this cuts off it's more like um beat these bosses as fast as possible beat these enemies beat the bosses beat more enemies beat the bosses beat the enemies beat the bosses until you've defeated five ways of bosses and then the map ends. If you did it fast enough, you can keep going, go deeper. Stuff gets more difficult. You have to beat more bosses. Not more boss ways, more bosses. So instead of two bosses or one boss, two bosses spawn. Instead of two, three spawn and so on and so forth. Um, and you could go endless mode if you technically want to. But there's also... Um, uh, you can do that on the on the level one of the map. And then you add curses to the map where you know you have random spells fly at you there will be meteors flying around and um there there will be like pillars that shoot spells at you and it just gets harder and harder and harder and uh it's like survive this map and kill all the enemies and kill all the bosses and then if you do it fast enough you can go deeper and all that sort of stuff and it goes up to curse level seven or eight i think something crazy like that and yeah it's just it's just really fun satisfying has pretty good music as well which is pretty important for uh, those types of games really and yeah i've i've been thinking like i, I sunk like 60 uh 60 30 hours into it because it's just good to play while like watching a stream or something um it is a little bit more on the pricier side um for early access for a game like this and for early access it is nine pounds well i mean they did have to pay for all of the art right so yeah, I mean, you know, I just, it's also not finished yet. And to be fair, they had to, they, they did, you know, all, there's there's a lot of different classes. There is yeah. 16 classes, I want to say, maybe? Like, there's oh, wow. a lot. It definitely seems like, like there's a, a lot more in the way of content for this game than uh, a lot of these games, at least at from the get-go. Yeah. Like, there seems to yeah, be a no, polish there's, to it's, it. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're polishing it. They've already done, like, they listened to community feedback. They immediately updated it, but people were like, well, the curse level, like going deeper, is kind of like not great. Can we like maybe like fix it? And then they were like, yeah, sure. And then they put out a patch that dealt with because the lag was really, 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 really bad. Mostly because um, this game uses a lot of dots. Like there's like there's poison and hemorrhaging and bleeding and stunning and dazing and frailty and like bajillion different dots that you put on with your attack, and um, you'll you'll end up with like. Um, 300 stacks of like doom or something on a, on a character and that was like lagging out the game because uh they were all like ticking down separately and all that sort of stuff like you can imagine what that does to to once you have like hundreds but well, not hundreds but like you know a hundred enemies on screen and they all have like bajillion stacks of like diff 10 different 20 different stacks of dots like it, it got it got crazy but they've they've um it's not gone but they've definitely made it a lot better in terms of lag and so they they do care and they put work in and it's just it's just one of those ones that's really fun um yeah if you so if you like poe and you like those those uh um survivor likes like this one combines both of that really nicely and um, I'm interested to see where it is, uh, where it goes. It does also have achievements. It has 100 Steam achievements. I mean, if you're making uh, one of these games and you don't have achievements, like, what are you even doing? Yeah, exactly. That's, that was actually the fun. Th that was that was actually kind of... Well, it has in-game achievements, right? So there's that. But uh, for the first one and a half weeks, um, Steam achievements didn't work. Like, they didn't pop. Like, the achievements in-game still tracked, but it didn't spawn on Steam uh because there was like they their game was not communicating communicating with the steam servers properly but they fixed it now and you can now achievement hunt in it like like mad and it does have a lot of accessibility settings it doesn't have a smooth cam um it doesn't have like stuff like depth of field or anything like that there is uh no screen shake 
um, and all that sort of stuff. So, and you can turn like damage numbers off. You'll turn them off really quickly, and you'll make uh, your and enemy attacks basically transparent eventually, because otherwise your entire screen will just go constantly flashing. Uh, it's kind of mad, but in a good way. Gotcha. <laughs> well, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, and uh, I gotta say, you know, a game doesn't have depth of field, screen shake, or smooth cam. Um, Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Whoa. not just kidding. Just literally kidding. can't have any of those things. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm just but, kidding. But yeah. um, so I, I I've talked about Dwarf Fortress on this podcast at length uh, and on various occasions, and it has a release date now, uh, which is December sixth, and it's getting kind of close. And I probably won't have played it by next episode, but I we probably all will have played it by the episode after. <laughs> um, because it'll be the ninth by that point. So that'll be, you know, three days is a pretty good amount of time to um, the talk before a recording session. So I, I just got to say, is there anything you two want to ask me about Dwarf Fortress before it releases? Um, I don't I actually have any questions. No, I'm, I'm just ex like, I know, I know I can play it now. I, I'm just really excited that I, that I can play Dwarf Fortress without having to go through the process of playing Dwarf Fortress. Through, through the process, no, no, through the process of like learning the language of Dwarf Fortress, like the symbols and all that sort of stuff. Um, because uh, having that barrier in there is not good for my for my particular brain. It just makes my brain go like, N no, I no. I don't want to. So I'm excited that that I won't have to force myself through that and I get to enjoy the game fully and finally delve properly uh, into the world of Dwarf Fortress and get to experience everything. Because I have played like a decade ago. So I have played a little bit, but uh, yeah. And I know technically I can already do it now with, with tile sets and all that sort of stuff, but... ADHD brain. It's a lot if of I work. have to put, if I have to put that much effort in it, my brain just goes like, "Yeah, but I can play that, and I can do it right now, and it's I don't have to do." So I'm excited. I'm excited to delve uh, deep, dig greedily, fall into lavas and aquifers, and uh, find the forgotten beast, and then um, die. I will die probably die way gloriously. before then. But yeah, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Same. Finally. So I, I guess great. kind of like the, the, the main thing that I just kind of want to get out here and and say, um, the game is not launching with achievements. <gasps> it will be getting achievements when awesome. Adventure Mode comes out because it's launching with two thirds of the game right now. So it's kind of difficult to have achievements when a good chunk of them are going to be tied to a mode that's not going to be in the game at launch. Yeah. No, of course. So that is something they've put aside. It will have workshop support at launch that and fantastic. Um, their last news post literally had a hey email our community manager if you're a mod maker and uh, want to get your mod on the workshop um before launch so there will be workshop stuff at launch um that's fantastic i think dwarf fortress is going to kind of have two launches i think there's going to be this one which is funny because a lot of people are wanting like early access, which is not going to happen because Dwarf Fortress doesn't qualify for early access, which I think is hilarious. Uh, and mm -hmm. people also want pre-orders, but Bay 12 can't open pre-orders because you can't open pre-orders if you haven't released a game on Steam before, which is also kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> it is hilarious, yeah. yeah. Or if you're owned by, or you can if you're owned by a publisher who's releasing your game, who's released games on Steam before, but they are not owned by their publisher. So like they, due to like weird fine print stuff, they literally can't open up pre-orders and they can't do early access. Um, but um, it's going to have two launches because there's the, the fortress mode is going to be the main meat of playability that's going to be releasing on the sixth, which is very much what people I think kind of have come to understand is the dwarf fortress mode. You know, it's the, it's, it's mm. what people are um, I think expect to play in dwarf fortress. And then, whenever so six months later a year later whenever they get adventure mode finished then we're gonna also have an open world rpg attached to it so it's gonna be it's it's gonna be curious i i think at this point it's too anticipated to really fail 
Um, I think there are a few wrinkles where some people might not like it. Like, I'm really curious to see, like, hardened RimWorld players try and play Dwarf Fortress because it is such a different thing. Um, right down to, like, it, it's 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 closer to... A, it's got almost more in common in some ways to a game like Populous than it does to um, something like RimWorld. Like, it's very much a god game in a lot of ways. Just no direct control... Very much like you give orders and the dwarves can just choose to ignore them. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, they do, but that's part of the game's charm. It's it's like um, a whole bunch of games that um, we already may have played or other or our listeners may have played um, uh, that are sort of colony builders in the same vein, but you only like build the colony and you don't control your people directly, like. Um, got king king on the mountain uh like can you don't control people directly in odd realm i don't remember yes you can you you can like control select but you can't tell them to do jobs you can just like control select and make everybody go somewhere go somewhere yeah clan folk is the same clan folk is very close actually because you have to have like all of those different workshop zones and you make x y z over there and then it gets transported into a different workshop where they take the planks Clan Folk's hoop, actually interesting make... because it, it's it's deeper yeah. in some ways in its crafting than Dwarf Fortress is. Yeah, yeah, it gets it gets really crazy. It's in that very regard. focused so on crafting. It's more like that rather than oh, this is Dwarf Rimworld. <laughs> yeah, no, I, right. I it, it 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 kind of uh, like perplexes me a little bit when I see people like uh, play Grim World with Dwarf Mod. They're like, we're playing. It's just like Dwarf Fortress. It's like. I, I, unless the game is keeping track of the temperature of the guy's armor that, that he's wearing, it's like, no, it's not Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> um, so, I I mean, it's it's a weird thing. It, it's got a lot of weird bugs, and those there will still be weird bugs in uh, Premium. Um, it's still going to be that weird, kind of clunky, sort of janky, held together with staples and duct tape game that's existed for a very long time, but just with, like, I think a sheen of polish that's going to make it more than playable for most people. I mean, people are okay with janky games. I mean, Ark has sold, what, the bajillion copies, right? <laughs> and that game barely mm-hmm. works. Uh, so it's like, I I, I I, hope people like it. That's... I'm sure they will, actually. I'm pretty sure they will. Like, Yeah, I'm, I mean, to be fair, like, even, even more than um, looking forward to the the ease of, like, getting into it with the, with the um, sprites and whatnot... I'm actually mostly looking forward to mouse control. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I'm this person. I don't know. I don't know if you like the same, but um, I can type on a keyboard and like I can orient my hand like was the wise. But if it's like, yes, but now press K to do something. I need to look down because I won't be able to find K. Like I know the general vicinity of K, but if it's like press K and then N and then R and then so A again. Not, not that, to that, be a big meanie. But I don't have any markings on my keyboard. Yeah, I can't do that. My I'm brain just goes people. like, Bloop. yeah, I can't do that. So for me, that's like just being able to click stuff um, is just mm-hmm. yeah. almost yeah. an accessib- accessibility feature in a way, even because it's just yeah. I, I I would I mean I could play it. I would just have to constantly look down on my keyboard to remember which which keys which key. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, little known fact: Dwarf Fortress, the old version, actually has full mouse support. It's just deactivated in the op- in the options menu, and there's no tactile notification when you click a thing. You just click a thing, and it jumps to new menu, and you don't know if you clicked on the right menu or not. Mm, I see. Ooh. Interesting. But like, it the, the original game does have mouse support, and you can play it with a mouse. I just I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I really would not. Mm. Um, but um. Yeah, it's 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 a weird beast. It's a weird creature. Uh, l- generating a world doesn't take four hours anymore, which I'm very excited about. You can generate a, a thousand years of history in about 20 minutes, which is phenomenal, instead of like six hours, which <laughs> on my computer, um, which is, you know, nice. But um, instead of me just sitting here and kind of rambling about Dorfort, um, uh, if there isn't anything else we need to cover in this section, I think we should just go to news. What do you guys think? Let's go yeah. to news. All Let's right. do it. We'll be right back after this. Hello, I am Sui. I am a part-time streamer on Twitch, part of the lovely House and Frequency, and I am also a full-time student. I stream primarily wholesome kind of indie games with, you know, slice of life, RPG, all that good stuff. 
And you can follow me over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash suey, S-U-W-E-Y. And we're back with the news section of episode 45 of the Halcyon Frequency Podcast. And uh, I got a couple of little news stories here. Um, I'm going to take the first one. Uh, and this is just something that made me mad when I saw it, and I'm still kind of mad about it. Um, so Risk of Rain, uh, a franchise that I really like. And I know at the very least, like, the two people that I'm talking to right now, Kiri and FG, you guys like the first one, correct? Yep. I've played both. it. Oh, I didn't know that you played the second one, FG, but... Um, I did, yeah. Okay, so, like, you know, we've, 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 we've all kind of touched this franchise, right? Um, I didn't 100% the first one, but I played a good amount of it, and I also didn't 100% the second one, but I also played a really good amount of it. Um, I played more of the second one because I could actually make the multiplayer work, whereas I couldn't with the first one. Um, and so Gearbox published Risk of Rain 2 um, and has recently stated that they are now the owners of the IP of Risk of Rain. Uh, this was a tweet that was posted on the Risk of Rain account um, for Risk of Rain 2. So they are working together now on the on porting the DLC, uh, Survivors of the Void, to consoles. And then post that point, um, it's going to be a Gearbox-developed product. Now, Gearbox has stated that uh, they will still be working with Hopo Games um, on DLCs and Risk of Rain IP moving forward. However, one of the Hopo Games um, developers on their Discord confirmed that no, they will not, in fact, be working on Risk of Rain 2 stuff going forward. Um, and apparently they have a project coming soon, which is not related to that. So I'm in two minds about this. Uh, I do not like Gearbox. Um, I don't like them at all. I've, I, it's, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Borderlands person. Borderlands, the main running games are, they're only consistently well received. And even those games can be mixed at times. Um, they are not very good stewards of other people's IP. Traditionally, they've done a very poor job managing other people's IP with just two examples, such as Duke Nukem Forever and, uh, Aliens Colonial Marines. Um, they're also notoriously not great with even managing their own IP. Some of the Borderlands games that, or the spinoff Borderlands games at the very least, a lot of them weren't received well. Uh, most recently, Tales from the Borderlands 2 or more Tales from the Borderlands or whatever they've named it, like, has had pretty middling response. Um, this is a franchise I love. I own every single soundtrack on physical record and I've put a good amount of time at each of those games, and it's kind of painful to hear that things coming from it in the future in a franchise that I really like um, is going to be overshadowed by the fact that it's run by a studio that is notoriously bad to IPs that they are the stu stewards of, and I am really bummed about this. So... I don't know if either yeah. of you have anything to this, but... I mean, there isn't really much to say except for hopefully I just, not, but... The one thing that I really want yeah, from the Risk of Rain IP yeah. that Gearbox can do to win me over know, right? and say... And, and the, the one thing that they can do that would make me genuinely happy, that would make me kind of okay with this, is if they put out a faithful, good, retooling update to the original risk of rain just put out a risk of rain like 10th anniversary edition or something that uses the like don't change anything about the game just make that multiplayer work and maybe add some more items and or map elements it it doesn't work on modern computers currently like it's it's lan only so the, I the no only issue with multiplayer or local only quite literally at this point so the only way you can play it is either with steam play together which works sort of oh or through like a Hamachi tunnel. Like it's 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 not possible to play it in multiplayer anymore. And it hasn't been for like five years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, like I I mean like I, I go on. I just checked. I played mm. Last time in April 2014. Yeah, no, it, I remember making it work back then. <laughs> so through, I, played, I remember going through a, a Hamachi multiplayer. That's how I made it work in the past. It was um, so much But like fun. a lot of that software just like hasn't been updated. Aww. Like Evolve and Hamachi have not been yeah. updated in, in ages. Um, and so like the tools to to play those that game in multiplayer are just gone. So like the it 
which which is a shame. And I I like Hopo games, and I I hope that they go make cool mm -hmm. things, and I hope that they stay independent. Oh, sad. Um, but like, yeah, I I really hope that this was a like they got paid situation because like we don't we don't really know what what money changed hands for this i really hope this was a they got paid and not a this dlc took too long to come out so we're going to default you on a contract and take the ip because it could have been either and um i really hope that they got paid for making cool games uh fg do you want to take this next one Yeah, so um, Blizzard, game, uh, game, Blizzard, and most of their games will, starting in January, I believe, no longer be accessible to users in China. It's not because Blizzard has been banned or anything like that. Oh yes, January twenty third. Um, but to be able to release a game in china you need to partner with a chinese company that does handle the um you know the release marketing everything in for the chinese market and uh there are a few out there most notably probably tencent and netease and netease used to um be that company for most of blizzard's for blizzard's um, and they were due for a renewal on their contract, um, to, you know, go put for the next, I don't know how many years, publish the games, um, over there. And they just couldn't make the agreement work. Why? We don't know. Um, neither has said anything, just that they, uh, couldn't make it work. Um, they could, just could not find an agreement. And so because most that, of the Blizzard games. Because Diablo Immortal was most developed them, by NetEase directly. Um, all but Diablo Immortal will no <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Will um going forward January twenty third no longer be available um to play in China. If you play on a Chinese server, though, because apparently if you if you mm. get a copy from abroad Some and or like if you make an abroad account a or using a and VPN, then VPN in China is illegal and can put you on a prison server that apparently still works <laughs> which is it's a bit much for a video game yeah yeah that there's there's obviously there's lots of issues like you know associated with that but um yeah though apparently a lot of people already like a lot of people apparently consume it and it it yeah they they don't really know what has what been this weird has, about like, video games for a while. There's a lot of speculation out there what the problem was, because um, China has really kind of, um, but yeah, they've been weird and they've can really gone like the word like of Christian like you know when it comes keep to like games. Um, teenagers away from gaming, like locking them up, like locking being able to game beside us. Yeah, a little it's bit. So like, like strange. Af after a certain um, uh, uh, time of day, you can't play anymore, and you need to have a, um, you know, you need to have an ID uh, number to put in. Um, that you know, for somebody that's like over eighteen and all that sort of stuff. And um, also, all games released in China must be approved, and they've been apparently like incredibly slow about approving new games. Like, there's like thousands of games in the queue waiting to be approved. Uh, there, there's the, a lot of the messy really interesting stuff going thing on in the background about this to me um, is which that is basically this is they, also that's why a they situation just... where this is a considerable portion of wow's remaining player base and wow is already a game that's dwindling in popularity and that's kind of massive <laughs> um so i i really wonder i think this is one of two things i think like either Absolutely this is going to happen has, yeah and it's yeah. going to be yeah. one of the first few death nails in the coffin for World of Warcraft just as a game. Or Microsoft's going to go through with the buyout of Activision Blizzard, reinstate a new deal, and it'll be really re-released in a year. One of two things is going to happen. Um, yeah, the, 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 the actual much bigger problem right now is... Um, semi-dead game starcraft 2 most pro grade like a lot of asian pro 
pro teams are Chinese owned and the uh, Chinese league is kind of like the highest league over there right now in the entire area after like no pro leagues I mean pro league's been gone for a while but like um, there isn't really a Starcraft 2 scene per se anymore in South Korea that's all kind of shifted and then over there, to China there's also just like, me speculating all of that is now there's also just me speculating here saying kind of maybe this is also a way <laughs> because, of making like, Blizzard look less you can't valuable, play the game in the country uh, anymore <laughs> because right now the hot topic right now between the Activision Blizzard deal is whether or not Call of Duty is going to remain on PlayStation and that's kind of the thing that they're really digging their heels in so I look at this also kind of in a way and go Huh, I wonder if they're just trying to make Blizzard Activision look less valuable so that they can survive that takeover. Like when you're trying to sell, when you're trying to sell, you know, like um, Square Enix selling off all of their Western studios all in a bulk to embrace maybe, it. Yeah. Like when yeah, you're trying maybe. to sell or you want to get bought or you're trying to change your business model, you shrink, you, you suck in, you make yourself as cheap as possible, and then you get bought and you reinflate. So I, there, there's there's a lot of possibilities here, and I I'm weirdly expected that if the Activision Blizzard yep. Microsoft uh -huh. deal goes through or for King, uh, Activision Blizzard King Microsoft deal goes through, um, I would be a little bit surprised if this didn't reopen. But yeah, it's gonna literally just like nuke the existence of the remaining StarCraft communities and uh, do irreparable damage to uh, what is remaining of the World of Warcraft community. Yeah, there's, they tend to, I mean, they're, you know, the Chinese yep. market is huge. We Same often massive, kind of overlook it, but game. it is But you know what's also huge? huge. Um, as of uh, yeah. time of recording right now, uh, the, I'm trying to look at how much the hot potato is made, but I op I keep opening the wrong window. Um, the, the, the hot potato uh, charity marathon is still ongoing, and as of time of recording has raised $34,862.57. <laughs> for Doctors Without Borders. So just uh, midway congratulations. And um, everybody's done uh, absolutely well done. phenomenal so far. Incredible. And I, I look forward to following the event until Monday. Um, I think that this is probably a good place to close down this podcast. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening, if you made it this far. And uh, let's just do a real quick around the table. Uh, Kiri, who are you and where can people find you on the internet? I'm Kiri. I stream strategy and indie and games on Twitch. I love achievement hunting in winter. I've got simulation sickness, and you can find me on uh, 2dkiri.com. I'm FG Squared. You can basically find me almost everywhere under and I'm FG blind. Squared, except on Twitter. And I'm blind as IRL on every platform. Exists, there's a sneaky uh, and like, screw the Twitter. The I'm still tweeting there for right now, but like, follow me on Mastodon, <laughs> which is at blindirl at mass.to. And might be at gaming dot lol or lol or something what what whatever Cr cringer's trying to launch a mastodon instance and i'll jump over there if that happens but um till then uh i just want to say if you want to find more episodes of this podcast you can find it at halcyonfrequency.com or at halcyon megahertz on twitter as long as that exists and uh if you want to talk with us about the podcast or the hot potato charity marathon or the game jams or anything else that we do you can find that on our discord server which can be found through the website and uh if you would if you uh cannot find this podcast on your podcast platform of choice please do please do send me an, uh, a a dm on discord uh under the same username and uh, let me know where you would like this podcast to show up because i will do my best to make it show up uh we these pod episodes go live every sunday so until next week don't change that dial uh this has been Halcyon Frequency, signing out. Mm -hmm.